Global Marketing and R&D For many, the ability to market products and services globally also brings a huge business opportunity. When domestic markets become saturated in developed areas of the world, extending beyond national borders allows a firm to capitalize upon countries experiencing economic and population growth. Marketing and R&D are related to each other. A critical aspect of the marketing function is identifying gaps in the market so that the firm can develop new products to fill those gaps. Developing new products requires research and development. Thus, the linkage between marketing and research and development. A firm should develop new products with market needs in mind, and only marketing can define those needs for R&D personnel. Also, only marketing can tell R&D whether to produce globally standardized or locally customized products. Research has long maintained that a major contributor to the success of new product introductions is a close relationship between marketing and R&D. According to Theodore Levitt, a powerful force drives the world toward a converging commonality, and that force is technology. It has transformed communication, transport, and travel. The result is a new commercial reality. The emergence of global markets for standardized consumer products on a previously unimagined scale of magnitude. Gone are accustomed differences in national or regional preferences. The globalization of markets is at hand. Ancient differences in national tastes or modes of doing business disappear. The commonality of preference leads inescapably to the standardization of products, manufacturing, and the institutions of trade and commerce. Market segmentation is a marketing term that refers to aggregating prospective buyers into groups or segments with common needs and who respond similarly to a marketing action. Market segmentation enables companies to target different categories of consumers who perceive the full value of certain products and services differently from one another. The objective of market segmentation is to minimize risk by determining which products have the best chances for gaining a share of a target market and determining the best way to deliver the products to the market. This allows the company to increase its overall efficiency by focusing limited resources on efforts that produce the best return on investment. Markets can be segmented in numerous ways. For example, we use geographical, demographic, sociocultural factors, and psychological factors. A product attribute is a characteristic that defines a particular product and will affect a consumer's purchase decision. Product attributes can be tangible or intangible in nature. Tangible attributes can include such product characteristics such as size, color, weight, volume, smell, taste, touch, quantity, or material composition. Intangible attributes may include characteristics such as price, quality, reliability, and beauty or aesthetics. For example, a hotel's attributes include atmosphere, quality, comfort, and service. Products sell well when their attributes match consumer needs. However, consumer needs vary from country to country depending on culture and the level of economic development. A firm's ability to sell same product worldwide is further constrained by countries' differing product standards. Countries differ along a whole range of dimensions. This would include social structure, language, religion, and education. These differences have important implications for marketing strategy. For example, when it comes to food, we have to be very careful as some food are not allowed for consumption because it may be against the religion. But let us remember that there is now a convergence of certain tastes and preferences. For example, American-style frozen dinners have become popular in Europe, but with some fine-tuning to local tastes. Consumer behavior is also influenced by the level of economic development of a country. Firms based in highly developed countries such as the U.S., tend to build a lot of extra performance attributes into their products. 
these extra attributes are not usually demanded by consumers in less developed nations. Even differences in technical standards can constrain the globalization of markets. For example, when it comes now to different technical standards for television signal frequency, it was difficult before to sell television that comes from the U.S. in Asia. A typical distribution system varies between and among countries. Take note that a firm's distribution strategy is a very critical element of the marketing mix. The four main differences between distribution systems are retail concentration, channel length, channel exclusivity, and channel quality. In some countries, the retail system is very concentrated, while in other countries it is fragmented. In a concentrated system, a few retailers supply most of the market, while in a fragmented system, there are many retailers, no one of which has a major share of the market. Channel length refers to the number of intermediaries between the producer and the consumer. When the producer sells directly to the consumer, the channel is short. When the producer sells through an import agent, a wholesaler and a retailer, a long channel exists. Fragmented retail systems tend to have longer channels. It has been observed that the longer the channel, the more expensive the product becomes. An exclusive distribution channel is one that is difficult for outsiders to access. The exclusivity of a distribution system varies between countries. Channel quality refers to the expertise, competencies, and skills of established retailers in a nation and their ability to sell and support the products of international businesses. The lack of a high-quality channel may impede market entry, particularly in the case of new or sophisticated products that require significant point-of-sale assistance and after-sales services and support. A choice of distribution strategy determines which channel the firm will use to reach potential consumers. The optimal strategy is determined by the relative costs and benefits of each alternative. Because each intermediary in a channel adds its own markup to the products, there is generally a critical link between channel length, the final selling price, and the firm's profit margin. The longer a channel, the greater the aggregate markup and the higher the price that consumers are charged for the final product. To ensure that prices do not get too high as a result of markups by multiple intermediaries, a firm might be forced to operate with lower profit margins. Thus, if price is an important competitive weapon and if the firm does not want to see its profit margins squeezed, other things being equal, the firm would prefer to use a shorter channel. Another critical element in the marketing mix is communicating the attributes of the product to prospective customers. A number of communication channels are available to a firm, including direct selling, sales promotion, direct marketing, and advertising. A firm's communication strategy is partly defined by its choice of channel. International communication occurs whenever a firm uses a marketing message to sell its products in another country. The effectiveness of a firm's international communication can be jeopardized by three potentially critical variables, cultural barriers, source effects, and noise levels. Cultural barriers can make it difficult to communicate messages across cultures. Because of cultural differences, a message that means one thing in one country may mean something quite different in another. Source effects occur when the receiver of the message evaluates the message on the basis of status or image of the sender. This can be damaging for an international business when potential consumers in a target country have a bias against foreign firms. Many international businesses try to counter negative source effects by de-emphasizing their foreign origins. A subset of source effects is referred to as country of origin effects or the extent to which the place of manufacturing influences product evaluation. 
For example, there are some people who, when they see Made in China, would automatically associate that with low quality or fake. While this may not be true all the time, companies have to come up with strategies to overcome negative perceptions. Remember, however, that source effects and country of origin effects are not always negative. Noise tends to reduce the probability of effective communication. Noise refers to the amount of other messages competing for a potential consumer's attention. In marketing, noise is anything that distracts from your message. Noise can be caused by too many messages. For instance, a print advertisement can have too many images or too much text. This will make it difficult for someone to remember what you're trying to communicate. To get rid of noise, make sure you have a clear, comprehensible message. A clear message will appeal directly to your clients. Avoid jargon and present concrete ways your product or service is better than your competitors. The main decision with regard to communication strategy is the choice between a push strategy and a pull strategy. Push strategy is one where businesses attempt to take their products to the customers. The term push stems from the idea that marketers are attempting to push their products at consumers. Businesses often use push when launching a new product or when trying to stand out in a niche or crowded market. Pull takes the opposite approach. The goal of pull strategy is to get the customers to come to you, hence the term pull, where marketers are attempting to pull customers in. From a business perspective, pull marketing attempts to create brand loyalty and keep customers coming back, whereas push is more concerned with short-term sales. Factors that determine the relative attractiveness of push and pull strategies include product type relative to consumer sophistication, channel length, and media availability. Firms in consumer goods industries that are trying to sell to a large segment of the market generally favor a pull strategy. Firms that sell industrial products or other complex products favor a push strategy. The longer the distribution channel, the more intermediaries there are that must be persuaded to carry the product for it to reach the consumer. This can lead to inertia in the channel, which can make entry difficult. A pull strategy relies on access to advertising media. In the U.S., a large number of media are available, including print media, broadcasting, and the internet. In many developing nations, the situation is even more restrictive because mass media of all types are typically more limited. A firm's ability to use a pull strategy is limited in some countries by media availability. In such circumstances, a push strategy is more attractive. For instance, Unilever uses a push strategy to sell consumer products in rural India, where few mass media are available. Moving on, should the firm standardize its advertising worldwide? Standardized advertising makes sense when, number one, it has significant economic advantages. Standardized advertising lowers the cost of value creation by spreading the fixed cost of developing the advertisements over many countries. Second, there is the concern that creative talent is scarce and so one large effort to develop a campaign will produce better results than smaller efforts. And the third justification for a standardized approach is that many brand names are global. With a substantial amount of international travel today and a considerable overlap in media across national borders, many international firms want to project a single brand image to avoid confusion caused by local campaigns. Standardized advertising may not be taken into consideration for some reasons. First, cultural differences between nations are such that a message that works in one nation can fail miserably in another. Cultural diversity makes it extremely difficult to develop a single advertising theme that is effective worldwide. Messages directed at the culture of a given country may be more effective than global messages. 
Second, advertising regulations may block implementation of standardized advertising. Given the two main arguments against globally standardized advertising, the multinational corporation may want to take a different approach. International pricing strategy is an important component of the overall international marketing mix. Firms must consider, first, price discrimination. This is the practice of charging a different price for the same good or service. It is a complicated price strategy that tries to extract consumer surplus and deadweight loss so as to increase profits relative to the benchmark case of uniform pricing. The most common types of price discrimination are first, second, and third degree discrimination. In an ideal business world, companies would be able to eliminate all consumer surplus through first degree price discrimination. This type of pricing strategy takes place when businesses can accurately determine what each customer is willing to pay for a specific product or service and selling that good or service for that exact price. So I can sell a car to different people at different prices. In second degree price discrimination, the ability to gather information on every potential buyer is not present. Instead, Companies price products or services differently based on the preferences of various groups of consumers. Most often, businesses apply second-degree price discrimination through quantity discounts. In short, the more you buy, the more discounts you get. Second-degree price discrimination does not altogether eliminate consumer surplus, but it does allow a company to increase its profit margin on a subset of its consumer base. Third-degree price discrimination occurs when companies price products and services differently based on the unique demographics of subsets of its consumer base, for example, students, military, senior citizens. The concept of strategic pricing has three aspects, predatory pricing, multi-point pricing, and experience curve pricing. Predatory pricing is the use of price as a competitive weapon to drive weaker competitors out of a national market. Once the competitors have left the market, the firm can raise prices and enjoy profits. For such a pricing strategy to work, the firm must normally have a profitable position in another national market, which it can use to subsidize aggressive pricing in the market it is trying to monopolize. Multi-point pricing becomes an issue when two or more international businesses compete with each other in two or more national markets. Multi-point pricing refers to the fact a firm's pricing strategy in one market may have an impact on its rival's pricing strategy in another market. Aggressive pricing in one market may elicit a competitive response from a rival in another market. As a firm builds its accumulated production volume over time, unit costs fall due to experience effects. Learning effects and economies of scale underlie the experience curve. Price comes into the picture because aggressive pricing can build accumulated sales volume rapidly and thus move production down the experience curve. Firms further down the experience curve has a cost advantage vis-a-vis -vis firms further up the curve. The ability to engage in either price discrimination or strategic pricing may be limited by national or international regulation. Thus, it is important to be knowledgeable about the different laws existing in different countries. Standardization versus customization is not an all-or-nothing concept. Most firms standardize some elements and customize others. Decisions about what to standardize and what to customize should be made after exploring the cost and benefits of its option. Firms need to invest in research and development and apply the technology to developing products that meet consumer needs and that can be manufactured in a cost-effective way. 
Research and development can be very costly, but it's going to help the organization find products that will now help them meet consumer needs and they will be able to produce these goods in the most cost-effective way. New product development is greater when more money is spent on basic and applied research and development, when demand is strong, when consumers are affluent, and when competition is intense. Although a firm that is successful at developing new products may earn enormous returns, new product development has a high failure rate. The reasons for such high failure rates are various and include development of technology for which demand is limited, failure to adequately commercialize promising technology, and inability to manufacture a new product cost-effectively. Firms can reduce the probability of making these mistakes by insisting on tight cross-functional coordination and integration between three core functions involved in the development of new products. These are research and development, marketing, and production. Tight cross-functional integration between these three can help a company to ensure that product development projects are driven by customer needs. New products are designed for ease of manufacture, development costs are kept in check, and the time to market is minimized.